is a wonderful pleasure to welcome Dr. Kenneth Calvert. He is the professor of history and the director of the Oxford program at Hillsdale College. And in this hour, we are discussing two of the online courses in which uh, he was an instructor. One is ancient Christianity and the other being the rise and fall of the Roman Republic. Dr. Calvert, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chuck. Very honored to be here. The honor honored to be with you. Thank you. Um, so I should like to begin by asking you, uh, what is the role of Christianity in the modern world? Wow. Well, I think that um, the role of Christianity in the modern world is actually very similar to what it was in ancient Christianity, in the ancient world, before it became a legal religion. Um, after the Reformation and Renaissance and into the modern world, uh, you've seen Christianity move from um, really a central role politically and culturally, particularly in Europe, um, to more of an independent um, uh, movement, um, religious movement among the nations in Europe and the United States and around the world. And honestly, it's in my mind, it is a, a remarkable period of growth and uh, evangelization in the modern world, particularly outside of Europe and outside of the United States. Um, just a, a brief story. I have a friend in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is not far from here. It's the, um, the home of the University of Michigan, one of the top universities in the United States. And um, this man is a missionary sent from Karachi, Pakistan, to the United States to be a missionary in the United States and in Ann Arbor. Um, and so you're seeing now uh, Christianity kind of switching places from being mainly a Western and European uh, religious force to now uh, being more in Asia, Africa, uh, South America, um, a much more potent um, movement. And primarily outside of its, its, its realm that you find in the Middle Ages, et cetera, uh, where, where Christianity had become part of the state and part of the political um, structure. So more independent um, and, frankly, uh, I would say in, in many ways more effective. Yeah. yeah, I can attest to that personally, because um, as you can guess from my uh, last name, I'm Vietnamese. Vietnamese, right. Yeah. And I converted to Catholicism uh, in around fall of 2022, so September wow. of that year. Yeah, um, that's great. And uh, I, I've lived here in um, Europe for like a year and a half, first actually in Vienna, Austria, and now in Budapest, Hungary. Um, one thing I do notice, though, is that um, during Sunday Mass, I get the option, depending on my schedule, to attend either the Hungarian language mass or the um, Vietnamese mass. Um, there's a huge Vietnamese community here and a wow. pretty big uh, Vietnamese Catholic community here too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what I always notice is that um, um, sometimes I, yeah, of course it depends on the, the time of the mass as well, but I always notice whenever I enter a, a Hungarian church mass, um, it would always be half empty, but whenever I enter my Vietnamese congregation, um, it's always packed, and yeah. sometimes you even overflows the chapel. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's a testament to that's that's that is that's remarkable and encouraging. And of course, um, Catholicism had been very much present in Vietnam um, up until um, the the communist reign, and there were some some very uh, powerful uh, martyrs and leaders uh, among the Vietnamese Catholics. And I, I, I tend to think that um, that situation, as well as many others around the world, um, is a good indication of how Christianity grows. Uh, Tertullian, the, the old father of the, uh, of, of the Western church, a Latin uh, writer said that um, the blood of the saints is the seed of the church. And I think that there is something to that, that where the church is persecuted and under pressure, um, it grows and flourishes. 
and where the church is perhaps more relaxed and luxurious and maybe a little narcissistic, uh, you don't see it being as prevalent. Um, so I, I think your situation there in Hungary actually gives us some indication of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and from your study of the early Christians, I wonder uh, if you, you know, if you pay some stock to the notion that um, something that I, I believe was echoed by C.S. Lewis, that to be a Christian means to be a bit out of lockstep with the world around you. Yeah, I think that's true. And, you know, there are many modern scholars who have shown that. G.K. Chesterton is also a, a wonderful example of that, or John Henry Newman, that um, to be a Christian probably in any culture at any time is a little bit out of step with the rest of humanity at that point. Because, um, of course, we are, uh, we are uh, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, and therefore we're sojourners through this world. And we're, we're never quite at home here. And I, I think particularly in, in modern Europe and modern America, um, there is uh, uh, a real sense of that right now, that Christians um, throughout the denominations, but particularly we Catholic Christians, um, we understand more and more uh, that we are out of lockstep with where the rest of the world is in our politics, in our morality, um, in our sense of what a human being is before God, um, all of that um, very much out of out of lockstep with uh, where the world is heading. Yeah. Yes. Um, one thing that I, I think you may have guessed it too, but um, in Vietnam past and present, as well as the Vietnamese uh, Catholic diaspora, uh, yeah. Almost all Catholic that I know uh, exhibits uh, a, a kind of antipathy towards communism mm. and also the current socialist regime uh, yeah. in, in Vietnam. And of course, I share their sentiments. Um, and this uh, harkens back to um, the Apostle Paul and how he is a both a you know, a a resident of the kingdom of heaven as well as the Roman citizen. Right. So the, the, I guess the dilemma of um, citizenship in the nation that you are of the worldly nation, which you were born into as well as the citizenship between the kingdom of heaven, to what yeah. extent do uh, the apostle Paul, as well as the early Christians of his time um, struggle to through that one? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, you know, in the modern world, the Catholic Church has really made some very important um, statements about communism and about socialism and about um, the whole idea of the dignity of the human person and that the human person is most connected with his local family, uh, with his local community, and that... Um, the power of a bureaucratic state coming in to um, really overthrow the, the dignity of the human person is something that the church has stood up against and is rightly so. And I think we find that too in um, the Roman world. You know, the Christians um, were not traitors. Uh, they were not rebels. Um, in fact, Paul makes it very clear in the book of Romans, as does Peter in his writings, that we are to honor the king and to honor the government. Um, but there's also the idea that um, we worship one God and we worship Christ and we cannot worship the gods of the state. And we can't worship the state. In fact, in my mind, uh, communism and socialism in the modern world is not that far distant from the old pagan world in which they worshiped the genius of the emperor. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the Christians... Uh, uh, a fine writer named Melito of Sardis uh, wrote a, a really wonderful little statement about Christians in the Roman world. And that is um, the Christianity came into history at the time of Caesar Augustus, the first emperor. Um, and they grew together. Um, and actually Christianity came into the world at that time to bring Christ into the world, to bring the gospel into the world and to bring, you know, the beautiful message, the good news into the world, um, and therefore to transform it. 
Um, and from him on, there is a constant message that the Roman world, if it would worship the true God, uh, would be a much better place, uh, a much more happy place and peaceful place than it was. And I think that there's something to that for us in the modern world, that if we simply, you know, work to or engage in conversation with our neighbors away from um, a desire to worship the state and political power uh, and point them towards the one who is the one who establishes all earthly authority. Um, you know, that's what the Christian message is in, in terms of its relationship with the world. And uh, I, I think in the United States, um, we are obsessed with politics here. Um, whatever position you are, right or left, I, I happen to be a conservative myself, but uh, in, in America, you know, a conservative in Europe, perhaps um, what we might call a classical liberal. Um, but the, the, the point of it is this, that even if um, we had, you know, what I would consider to be a good slate of conservative politicians, I would know that there's no way in the world that those men or women or earthly people would bring about heaven, would bring about utopia. It's, it's impossible in this life. Um, and so I, I think that the, the, the Roman world um, is, is some evidence of that. Christianity finally won under Constantine, but it, it, it produced a whole new set of problems uh, for the Christians. Um, and that's just the way it's going to be in, in this world, I think. Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, one last point about communism. Um, Vietnamese Catholics, uh, we love our John Paul II. And yeah. I certainly believe that um, uh, His Holiness is opposition to communism um, was obviously courageous, but also very, in some ways, risky because when he when he speaks, um, a billion or so Catholics listen. And right. um, and there are certain corners of the world, um, I'm thinking, I suppose, of Latin America, for example, where um, faithful Catholics uh, see no uh, conflict between their beliefs as uh, and, um, say, beliefs in the, a socialistic form of government. I'm thinking of something right. like liberation theology. Right. Um, they think it, that um, their reading of um, the Gospels translates uh, neatly into um, a socialist form of government. So, how would you how would you provide a reading that runs contrary to that political point of view? Yeah, and I I can understand in regions of the world where um, there has been um, the kind of oppression that we're talking about, perhaps in Central and South America, um, that would produce dictators or tyrants against which the Catholic Church would want to stand and to produce a kind of contrary political authority such as what you might have in socialism and communism that would be able to adequately and with a certain sense of authority and power um, uh, counteract or contradict those, those uh, dynasts and those dictators. And so what, what appears to me what happens, and this is something that the church spoke out against as well, um, against socialist and communist systems, because they tend to then replace the old dictatorships with just a new sense of um, oppression. And we see that happening in El Salvador and in Nicaragua right now that um, the church is now being oppressed by the governments there, the states there, um, because the church uh, at first supported some of that liberation theology, but now that the liberationists, the communists and the socialists are in power, uh, the church is finding that um, there is indeed a new form of, of oppression. And um, so I, I think that, you know, every state, every region, every culture um, goes through its own um, what experience of this kind of thing. I, I, I think that the Vietnamese saw that. Uh, I think that Catholics often in Eastern Europe, and, and I think of some of the Catholic leaders in the old Soviet Union, um, uh, Athanasius Schneider, for instance, 
who understands what the socialist, communist, liberationist, if you will, um, approaches bring about. And so can speak to Central and South America with some encouragement and some wisdom uh, that they they then need to to go through this whole process on on their side of the of the of the ocean. Yeah. I remember uh, when I was still back in Hanoi, uh, I heard a sermon um, which was uh, delivered in Vietnamese where the father um, spoke in great detail about how um, uh, Vietnamese Catholics uh, like ourselves should not be ashamed to cross ourselves uh, before yeah. a meal um, yeah. uh, in amongst like a non-Catholic company. And to this day, I still marvel at like how powerful that was. That was like one of the most memorable sermons that I can think of. Um, and I think of that when you've uh, mentioned uh, your conservative politics, um, because I understand that um, uh, uh, conservatives in America feels a bit under siege these days. Um, the institutions of ideas and power yeah. and prestige uh, all seems to drift leftward. Um, yeah. But um, you know, uh, from a non-American point of view and also a, a sort of like Western European-ish uh, conservative point of view, I think that there's a lot that um, conservatives can offer to the American, I guess, politics and society that is an alternative because we know that um, many of these left-wing ideas have not worked out for the better. So. Right. Um, I'll leave that to you. Uh, what do you believe that conservatives can offer that can, uh, I guess, restore the health of the nation, so to speak? Yeah, so it's it's a very interesting, we're, we're in a great deal of flux here and a great deal of change. And um, I'm, of course, very optimistic because, well, I'm a Christian and I Catholic, I'm a Catholic and I know that the Lord um, is, is, you know, providentially uh, overseeing all of this. Um, I think that I, I have two thoughts. One of them has to do with kind of the old school conservative um, approach in the United States, uh, which is very patriotic, uh, very Christian, um, and very much, um, I guess, what I would sometimes say, naive, uh, because we had become so used to being the norm that in the midst of transformation and change, we haven't adjusted to that to be able to respond well and respond, I think, sometimes successfully to the to the challenges of the left. And, uh, you know, the left is always saying that they love humanity, they love children, and their policies are going to be able to help the poor, all of these kinds of things. And I think what conservatives in the United States need to recapture is the idea that we love humanity uh, in, in, in the way that God has intended us to love humanity, not by absolving them of any responsibility and creating some sort of great governmental structure, but by encouraging them to really seek after all that the Lord has wanted for them. Um, in the United States, we have tended to surrender the care for the poor and for those who are in need to the state. And I think it would be good for us to recapture that, uh, that real desire to help the poor and, and to be the kind of Christians that the Lord has asked us to be. Um, so I, I think there are things that, can, that used to be part of conservatism um, that, that we need to recapture. Now, a second thing I, I think is really interesting that's going on here is that a lot of the immigrants that are coming into the United States uh, are Hispanic. Um, we also have a lot of Asians uh, coming in. And what's really interesting is that as people talk to them, um, as the pollsters from the, the media talk to them, they're finding that these people are, um, a, a great many of them, hold to the same conservative values and convictions uh, that conservatives in America hold to. Um, a lot of the Hispanics are old school Catholics, um, many of them from Venezuela and from Colombia and from Central America, where these states are not friendly to Christians and not friendly to, 
to conservative old school Catholics. Um, and those people are coming here. And that is um, something that I think the left did not count on, that by opening up immigration the way they have, and, and I am not for open borders, I think we need to be very, very careful with that. But so many of the people who are coming into the United States now actually understand the foundations of American conservatism uh, very well. And uh, I think that it would be good for American uh, kind of old school American conservatives to kind of grab hold of some of that um, that new conservative energy that's entering the country. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, so as I observe um, the political situation going on in uh, your Greek Republic right now, um, aside from the usual conservative versus liberal um, conflict, there's also a growing feeling of animosity with uh, those who are non-elites versus those who are elites. Right. And, and it it reminded me of um, one of my favorite Shakespeare plays, as well as mm. one of his best and most underrated plays, uh, Coriolanus, mm. um, where, the, where it depicts uh, the conflict between the patrician, which I suppose are analogous to the elites of uh, the Roman Republic and the plebeians. Right. The right. masses, um, um, and I suppose uh, as a scholar of uh, ancient Roman times, uh, to what extent do you find Coriolanus historically correct? That's one part of the question. Well, yeah, point. it's it's definitely a product of Shakespeare's time, yeah. um, and what he's what he is addressing in Coriolanus, I think, are some of the tensions that they're seeing then. Uh, between the elite and um, the lower classes. And I, I, I think this is a really interesting insight, Chung, that you have. I, I, what, I would, what I would want to address, I think, in the midst of all of this is when Constantine converted to Christianity and Christianity became, went from being a persecuted uh, minority to now um, a minority in charge of the state or very much in, intertwined with the state, and then you became very quickly a majority. Um, there was a lot of tension between the elites and the rest of the population. Great saints like St. Athanasius of Alexandria or John of Antioch, also John Chrysostom, um, these bishops who were part of this new era saw that there were Christians who are now becoming part of the elite class and actually oppressing fellow Christians. Um, the Empress Eudoxia in Constantinople um, uh, was, was a very, very luxurious, narcissistic Christian, quote unquote, emperor and empress. And um, John stood up to her. And she ended up martyring John. Um, he died for that. And so you see that there's this transition. Now, in the United States, what's very interesting is in the, what, what was once a very vibrant free market economy and society has now moved, at least since the time of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, slowly but surely in the direction of being more of a controlled society and controlled economy. Now, what that's meant is that there's been a whole new elite class emerge. Um, and honestly, it's those on the left and those who claim to be most, um, what, most in favor of helping the working people and the average everyday guy and, and, and gal What's happening here is that this elite class um, now is the luxurious kind of narcissistic class, and their policies are not designed to help um, those who are the, the workers, but really designed to help keep that upper elite class in power. Uh, we see that in, in Europe, I would argue. Um, we certainly, I think, are seeing that more and more in the United States. And this is where the conservative movement in the United States, um, I think, is beginning to wake up and beginning to see what has happened um, and to really push back on this elite class 
that wants to run our lives. Um, so I think, I think that this is not a new theme. It's not a new problem. It's, it's fairly consistent in human history. Um, uh, Shakespeare saw this. Uh, and I think that we see this um, only it's in a new guise. It's in the guise of this progressivism, this socialism and communism um, as compared to old forms of politics. Um, the, the church, our, our, mis our message is for all people to come to Christ. Um, in Christ, there is no male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. You know, we are all one in Christ. And that is where the true, if you want to call it egalitarianism or equality exists um, among the believers and in the church. Uh, it's not a political egalitarianism or economic egalitarianism. It's a spiritual egalitarianism that, that plays out in how we love God and love our neighbor, to be sure. But it does not mean that uh, we're oppressed by a system that tells us how to do our business, uh, how to uh, run our lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes any sense. I, well, I, yeah, I, uh, it, it does. And, and more. I, <laughs> and so uh, I was about to ask you regarding um, to what extent is the um, patrician plebeian divide of uh, ancient Roman time corresponds with uh, our time in the American Republic, but um, I see that you yeah. already. Yeah, I, I guess I guess I would say in uh, along those lines, the patricians um, were at the at the at the beginning. Uh, that was an aristocracy. That was uh, that was you were a patrician depending upon your family. Now the plebeians were able to work their way up into um, the upper classes and become senators and consuls during the what we call the struggle of the orders in the fifth and fourth century BC. So there were changes there. And Jefferson and Adams both, both talked about how much Rome, the Roman Republic, um, can be a model for America. And what they saw was this, that on the one hand, yes, the idea of Senate and people of Rome, a Republican government uh, in balance um, with interests of the people of the Senate and of the magistrates, that can work. What Jefferson and Madison did not like was the nature of the aristocratic um, Senate, uh, its aristocratic nature of the patricians, um, of the fathers of the state. Um, and therefore, you know, there had to be some real care there um, in, in how we establish these, this balance of power. Now, I, I say that, and, and um, one thing that's interesting that has emerged over time in the United States and in our Republic is a tendency towards an aristocracy. Um, particular families that govern or um, particular families that all send their children to Harvard and Yale and, and Princeton, these great universities, and they become the ones who govern. They are quite often senators and congressmen and presidents have graduated from these schools. So you see a, a, a narrowing of citizenship uh, a way, in ways that the, the founding fathers did not attend, intend. And so, um, yeah, it's, it, there, that patrician plebeian aspect is sometimes there. But that is something that the founders wanted to avoid, um, that kind of aristocratic uh, class na nature. Um, the idea that every citizen... Uh, would have the dignity and respect owed to them, and they would all have an equal say in who's elected and what kind of legislation is produced. That really is at the core of our republic and what we need to get back to, frankly. Yeah. Um, a book that I read uh, recently is um, Michael Novak's On Two Wings. Yeah. It's a wonderful text. Um, yeah. Where um the um the great catholic theologian um examines to what extent were the founders christians the christianity right. of the founders and right. that's always been a topic of debate um you know um we have ample remarks from um to, to name a few examples john adams and thomas jefferson saying how much they dislike um 
the church hierarchy and what they right. see as a, a theocracy in, I suppose, a pre-colonial era of Massachusetts. Right. But, uh, we can also see in the same body of writings, their utmost reverence to uh, God and Christ mm -hmm. and the Judaic people that inspired Christianity. So uh, what's your stance? Yeah. It's, it's really hard because um, Jefferson, at least towards the end of his life, um, becomes more deistic. Um, and he talks about not liking Catholics. He also talks about not liking Calvinists. Um, he calls the Calvinists uh, diabolical or demonic. Um, and so there is um, there is an interesting tension here with Jefferson. Now, um, on the other hand, um, well, let me say this first. James Madison was decidedly a Christian. Uh, Charles Carroll, uh, decidedly a, um, a serious Catholic, as was his cousin, John Carroll. Um, there was a good Catholic presence, though small. Um, in fact, the Calvert family uh, was one of the uh, Catholic families in those days. But um, the Catholic presence was small, but they were there. Um, now, in the Jefferson in, in, in the realm of Jefferson, just to, to try and give a good example of this, when he was president of the United States, um, there was a group of Baptists, the Danbury Baptists of Connecticut, who wrote to him, and they were concerned about um, the state of Connecticut basically making them second-class citizens. And what Jefferson said was, well, you know, in the state and at the federal level, particularly at the federal level, which is the only level he could really speak to, he said, there's no way that we should tell you uh, what kind of religious expression you have. And so as Christians, as Baptists, uh, there's a there's a wall of separation between the government and your practices, and you should be allowed um, to be faithful Christians as you see fit. Now, there was another letter that he received um, in 1805 from uh, a group of, of nuns in New Orleans, the Ursuline Sisters of New Orleans. And not many people know about this letter. And they wrote a letter very similar to the Danbury Baptists and said, now that the United States controls New Orleans and the Louisiana Purchase, this was during the time in which the Louisiana Purchase was made, um, now that we're under the United States, what does that mean for us and for our, our, our convent, for our school for girls, and for our hospital? And Jefferson wrote back, and he said, we have nothing to say about any of that. You are free to practice your faith and your religion as you see fit. So this was, a, this was even beyond what he said to the Danbury Baptist. To the Danbury Baptist, he says, you can practice your faith. But to the Ursuline sisters, he says, you can not only practice your faith, but you have the freedom to teach what you want in your school. You have the freedom to run your hospital as you see fit. Um, those important institutions, um, Jefferson said, were out of bounds uh, for, for uh, the federal government. And that's something we can draw from today, that it's it's not up to the state to tell us what to do in our schools and in our hospitals, et cetera. But more than that, in both of these letters, uh, more, more to your question, in both of these letters, Jefferson basically said, um, pray for me and I will pray for you. And there you have a man who perhaps is not orthodox the way we would like in a Christian way. Uh, but there is, there is in his writings and in what he approves of and encourages uh, some traditional Christianity. Um, now, in the end, and I'll talk about this just briefly, in the United States, the idea of um, our, our, uh, our Bill of Rights, our Constitution in regard to religion is that there would be no state church, and not that the founders were anti-Christian, not that the founders wanted to do away with Christianity, not at all. Um, what their belief was, was that the Christian denominations should have the freedom to make their case and have the freedom to, to be Christian. And if people were convinced 
and joins them, fantastic. If not, that's okay too. Now, the founders clearly thought Christianity was the foundation for uh, American life, American morals, American uh, education. Uh, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, uh, Article 3, says that religion, morality, and knowledge are necessary for education, and the religion they're thinking of is Christianity. But, um, and so they believed that this was, to a great extent, a Christian nation, not defined by any one Christian denomination, okay? But it was also very clear um, uh, Judaism was encouraged and allowed in the United States, and other religions began to come in as well. Um, and one reason why they were welcome and allowed was because of the Christian idea that we should love our neighbor and um, the American idea that there should be freedom of religion. And we should all have the opportunity to to make our case, right? Yeah. Now, um, one of the um, topics I've, I've thought about recently is... Um... Um, I think I've thought about this a lot, but just today I thought about like how um, how the U.S. school system uh, miseducates their young, um, and you know not just in the university system, of course, Hillsdale right. being uh, exempted from that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, but also the K to twelve system. Um, mm -hmm. There are you know despite the world class um, standards that the American um, facilities of higher education provides, um, K-12 has been abysmal. And one of the arguments that um, I think uh, pervades American politics is uh, one in regards to school choice. Mm. So whether parents should send their kids to the the school uh, the school based on this district that they are in, or should right. they you know, select their own schools that befits their kids the most? And of course, uh, in this uh, state versus market argument, uh, I would lean rightly towards the market. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's some personal reasons too, because uh, I, I was um, I studied for twelve years in the Vietnamese school system, and um, it, I think it certainly failed me. Um, and I, I certainly believe that there is something within uh, either a public or um, a state directed school system that that fails children because they they aspire the same level of standards to all kids from all different backgrounds and for right. a, a, a nation as diverse uh, religiously and culturally like like the u.s um i don't think that standard holds up so um i'd like to hear more of your thoughts on that yeah so public schools uh the history of that in the united states actually began with the puritans um in new england um and early on, uh, certainly the founders, what they envisioned for public schools was um, an education that would lay the foundations of the liberal arts, foundations of um, civics, uh, economics, um, that would make for an intelligent and informed citizenry. That was the original idea. Um, unfortunately, what came along, and this began in the late 1800s in the United States under the influence of John Dewey, is that um, American education became more practical, quote unquote, uh, and the idea that, um, you know, you needed to have a state guided system that uh, pushed students one way or another into where the state believed they were best suited. Um, as if the state could make that determination. And of course it can't. <laughs> and uh, what you began to see then was a mode of public education that was extremely standardized, one, sit, one, one uh, style fits everybody. And um, even though they like to talk about being diverse, uh, the public schools are not. Um, They're very much a cookie cutter kind of institution, all of them. Uh, and it's kind of it's kind of depressing when you see going on there. And students really are not taught to think for themselves. They're not taught to be citizens. 
um, they're they're taught to be subjects of the state and not citizens in the state or over the state. And so what um, we're beginning to see, of course, are the results of that. And one thing that's exciting in my life is to be part of Hillsdale College, because not only are we uh, a college, an institution that stands up against the trends, but also in establishing K through 12 schools around the country. We're very, very interested in um, returning to some of the old models of education. And, um, and the only way you can do this successfully is primarily through private efforts, uh, but also through homeschooling. And we have a lot of homeschooling and a lot of successful homeschooling. And then many states have what are called charter schools and this idea that these are not part of the typical um, public school system. They're actually part of um, an independent system. And that is that is bearing some fruit as well. Um, I think that the, the numbers I've seen that something like 30 to 40% of students now in the United States are now in one of the alternative forms of education homeschooling, private schooling, charter schools. And um, I am I think that's going to bear a lot of fruit, but it's going to take another generation for us to see all that fruit, you know, come from that the new forms of schooling. Um, and, and again, it's very interesting that when you look at the immigrant population coming into the United States, um, a lot of a lot of that population is demanding better than what the public schools are offering them, uh, and that too I think is a real shocker to the uh, to the left uh, and to what they think um, that these immigrants should have, which is a standardized uh, cookie cutter education. So it's um it's 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 been a very very difficult time and worrisome time. Um, but in my in my experience, since, for instance, 1990, um, in 1990, you saw really the emergence of the first strong classical school movement. And that's what we call these schools, classical schools that really get us back to the classical models. Um, and from that time to this time, you know, in the, in the, in the 21st century, over the last 30 years, that's been a remarkable growth in what I would say are good old school uh, academic institutions. Now, what we need to do is, is get more of the universities and colleges on board. Right now, it's primarily K through 12. Um, I'd love to see us do more at, at, the, at the higher levels. Yeah. Yes. Um, funny enough, I actually was thinking of John Dewey when I, uh, earlier today and how yeah. it's, um, educational theories uh, is more negative than positive. Um, yeah. Um, so I believe uh, you mentioned in the um, ancient Roman history class that um, one of the one of the key uh, subjects that um, Roman children were learn in their education is um, is patriotism uh, yeah. for their for the yeah. Roman Republic and. Right. Um, as you mentioned uh, earlier about like um, the the immigrants from Latin America and um, East Asia who come to this country, uh, what's unfortunate is that while well, the the first generation, uh, the fresh off the boat generation, uh, so called, uh, they uh, uh, they hold certain conservative values. Uh, their younger ones actually, um, in their process of assimilating into American society, actually become more liberal and progressive. Yeah. And um, I I cannot help but thinking that the public school system that uh, they've been involved in is partly responsible for that. Um, I certainly believe that, um, amongst other things, uh, American public schools have failed to teach kids um, a sense of uh, patriotism to the American nation. Um, so how do you suppose uh, that can be a remedy? <laughs> well, I think that... Uh the um the return to patriotism you know because within progressivism and within progressive thought um a love of country a love of your local community um that is to be discouraged 
because the, the whole idea of Marxism, uh, the whole idea of this form of regressivism is to give it an international flair where the, um, the person uh, becomes a, a world citizen rather than say a citizen of the United States. And I think that what these, these new students have to understand, and this is something we try to help students understand, is that, you know, that original off the boat immigrant generation came here to escape something. And in the modern world, the vast majority of time, what they have come to the United States to escape is the progressivism, the socialism and communism that our own schools are now trying to promote. And um, to, to try and help these younger generations come into better contact and understanding of their parents and of that, that first uh, generation of immigrants, I think is, is one way to do that. Um, I know a man who is, is actually, uh, he came from um, communist Poland uh, back in the 80s, uh, came to the United States and is very much involved. He doesn't have an official program, but he's very much involved in going around and talking to American students, both at university campuses and in K through 12, and help them understand his experience as uh, and, and someone who escaped communism and came to the United States for a reason. Um, and that reason is freedom and liberty. Um, the patriotism of the United States, again, actually is something that I, I want to address. Um, quite often, patriotism is assumed to be a connection to one culture or language. Um, um, you know, for instance, if I'm a patriotic Frenchman, I love France, right? Um, and all things French. Uh, the United States has some of that, but more than anything, our patriotism, our love is for an idea. And it's that idea expressed in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them being life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, that idea is what makes us American. Um, and I, I think that so many of the immigrants that come into the United States, that's what they come for. That's what they understand, right? And, and again, we need to reach out to this younger generation, second generation, third generation, and help them understand why their parents and grandparents first came to this country. Um, and that it's because of who we are as Americans at our very core. Um, and that seems to me, and that's something that we have seen work. Uh, but again, there's just so much work to do. Um, it, it sometimes seems overwhelming, but uh, we just have to keep going. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, one of my um, favorite activities uh, is to look at people who are avowedly um, atheists and most likely leftists quoting scripture to earn like a gotcha points against right. you know, Christians. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of that line from the Princess Bride movie. Uh, I don't think that means what you think it means. In to the and all that. Great movie, by the way. Yeah. 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 Wonderful film. Um, <laughs> and one of the, um, one of the gotcha points that they would use is uh, if you are to uh, if you are to love Christ, then um, when Christ says my kingdom is not of this world, then how can you uh, you know have this dual citizenship between say being a Christian in God's kingdom and being uh, in uh, your case uh, an American? Uh, so uh, I think I've started this uh, question of how Christians in Roman times uh, reconciled the, those two um, parts of their citizenship. So right. how do how do Christian Americans or American Christians reconcile yeah. their love for Christianity as well as their love for America? Right. I think that it's important that we always keep in mind 
that yes, we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Um, we have to also remember the incarnation, um, that God became man, that he did not leave the world as it was to flounder, but that Christ came into the world to be its savior, to be its Messiah, uh, to be its Christ. And that um, the Lord uh, is king of all creation, as kingdom of heaven, but also, as we find in Scripture, is ruler over events and activities in this world. And, and therefore, um, we Christians have a responsibility not only to honor our Lord uh, in his heavenly kingdom, but also the kingdom and the I guess I'll put it more carefully, the church is his body uh, on earth, and he works through his church to minister. So that is where our extension of the kingdom of heaven ends up in this world and within the various political systems that exist. And so um, the Christians in ancient Rome, uh, they were the body of Christ in ancient Rome, calling Rome to Christ and working uh, in so many ways uh, as, as evangelists, as apologists, as um, people working among the poor, etc. And so in the United States, what I think we should always remember as Christians in the United States is, first of all, the United States isn't perfect. It's made up of a lot of fallen people, and therefore you can't expect America, America to be perfect. Um, in, in the famous words of, of Winston Churchill, though, uh, I think it was Winston Churchill who said that, you know, democracy is, is a lousy form of government, but it's better than all the rest. Um, I think we see that in, in America, that um, one reason why we need to be patriotic and need to promote Christian principle or American principles is simply because we have the freedom here to promote Christian principles and to be Christian and to express uh, what it is to be uh, members of the body of Christ in an open, free uh, society. Um, I think that the founding fathers wanted that. That's very much what they envisioned. And I think that's what we uh, conservative Christians and you know politically conservative people need to do, is to remember that at the core of this uh, there is a, a great deal of who we are as Americans is wrapped around this idea of religious freedom. Um, and we need to promote that and to encourage that and, and to be um, uh, 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 you know, talking about this as much as possible. But yeah, I think that, um, you know, I can be, I can be a Christian and part of the body of Christ in any country, in any nation, in any political system. Uh, that's just the nature of the church. But it is a particular honor and particular blessing to be an American and to be a member of the body of Christ in this country because of the freedom we have to be Christian and to express our faith um, and to be fully, you know, patriotic members of the of the kingdom of heaven as well as of uh, our beautiful country. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, I'd like to end on this note. Um, in the ancient Christianity course, uh, you mentioned that Jesus, our Lord and Father, um, he uh, represented a continuation of um, uh, his uh, Judaic roots, uh, yeah. but he yeah. also uh, represented a decisive break from it. Yeah, Jesus also uh, represented uh, this trend of uh, Greek philosophy. We see him uh, engaging in di dialectical um debates with the Pharisees amongst all people. And like right. Socrates, he was uh, uh, accused of blasphemy. Right. But of course, uh, he also represented a break from the Greek philosophical tradition. Right. And when I think of all that, um, I would like to ask you, um, there was a world before Christ and there was a world after Christ. We still right. use BC and AD for that reason. Right. right. Um, this may be a tough question, but what do you believe is uh, the most important uh, change from BC to AD? Well, I think that um, 
again, I have to get back to the incarnation. Um, Clement of Alexandria points out that Greek philosophy was a preparation for the arrival of the gospel. Um, the Old Testament and all that is there, um, you know, you can see Jesus uh, present in so much of the prophecy there, pointing ahead to him. And so I think that we have to understand it. I would also add, uh, and I, I, I talk about this a little bit in my ancient Christianity lecture, um, the emergence of the Roman Empire. Um, it emerges, all of these things converge, in my mind, perfectly in the first century, in the coming of Christ, in his birth, his life, his death and resurrection. It all comes perfectly at that point. And it's at that point that with the with the atonement and the the the, the resurrection as the main message of Christianity, um, and the church being the body of Christ in the world, that that's the transition that takes place there. That the world now has access to and hears the good news, the gospel, by way of um uh, of Christ's body by way of his church. And you look at the Catholic Church in particular, of which you and I are both members, um, a billion people around the world proclaiming the gospel. Um, who would have thought that in the first century AD? Um, it's a remarkable blessing to be part of that, by a part of God's providence. Um, so I think that that to me is... Uh, is is the great message that's that's the transformation that took place uh, a world as john says that was living in darkness has now seen the light um it's for them to accept it or reject it but the light has come into the world yeah well on that wonderful note thank you very much dr kenneth calvert for joining the show john thank you for having me <laughs>